You know, last night I was on the ferry coming over. I was riding my motorcycle back uh, from our uh, denomination. The British Columbia um, Conference of Mennonite Brethren Churches has their annual convention in, in Abbotsford this year. And I was coming back from that event on the ferry. And I was the first in the queue of the, all the motorcycles ready to get off the ferry. And the ferry traffic guy, whatever, what do we call it? The ferry traffic guy. That's his, he has a name tag. I think it says that. And uh, yeah, he, he said, after, after th- I'll let three cars go out, and then it's your turn. And so, you know, I, I got my bike started. I was all ready, and he let three cars go out, and I proceeded to go. And I heard yelling behind me, but by that point, it was too late to stop and back up. You don't have reverse on a bike. And I, I realized he actually let four cars out, and I shouldn't have gone when I did. Uh, but, you know, he'd made a prediction less than two minutes before that didn't come true. Uh, and it reminded me uh, there are very few things in our control. We can, even in the immediately near future, we can try to make a prediction, and there's so many things out of our control. It's incredible to me the prophecy we have in Daniel chapter 8. Hundreds and hundreds of years before many of these events came true, uh, the Lord not only knew, but He decreed. Uh, how these things would unfold for his glory, for our great good, for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, and also for the judgment of the nations. And so let's pray to this great God and ask him to teach us through his word this morning. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, you are great, you are holy. You reign sovereignly, Lord, and we humble ourselves before you because when I came this morning, and I know that many others are probably in similar positions, that when we came this morning, maybe our thoughts were on other things. Maybe we had not humbled ourselves. Maybe we were feeling entitled or disappointed by things we think we deserve. Maybe we were looking forward to things we count on and assuming the way the day would unfold before us. And yet, Lord, if you will... Let us remember you are holy and you rule. And let us always attach to our plans and our agenda and our ambitions, if the Lord wills. We thank you for this word that reveals your majesty and your sovereign rule through your son, Jesus. We thank you for this word that reveals the depth of sin and its seriousness. Not only its earthly consequences, but as a sign of its eternal consequences. And we thank you for this prophecy that promises restoration one day. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our restorer, our redeemer, and friend. And praise you, Lord. Amen. I uh, was up late last night and I fell asleep trying to make changes to my sermon because I wasn't happy with it. I fell asleep. So what you get is what you've got. And uh, um, this, I, I'm pretty sure uh, there's going to be all kinds of things I could have done better here. I had little time, less time than I thought I would have this week to work on this. Uh, nonetheless, I believe the Lord has a word here. So if you'll put up with my stumbling uh, and let's attend to what the Lord has said through his word. I'd like you to notice what Daniel writes in verse 15. And this is the first of my headings here. Daniel sought to understand uh, the vision that he had seen. And so I, I, I trust just you look at verse 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. Daniel had seen a vision, and we looked at it last week in verses 1 through 14, of a ram with two horns, and then a goat with a big horn, and then that horn is broken off, and four horns grow in its place. And then out of one of those four horns, another horn grows, and I'm just kind of skimming through verses 1 to 8. Another horn grows in verse 9, out from one of the four horns, (laughs) and it, uh, it brings desolation. Upon, uh, we can only presume, are God's people. I suggested last week that this was talking about uh, the trampling of Jerusalem and the Jewish people uh, under the power of this little horn that doesn't stay little but becomes big and grows great in different directions and is fearful. Let me suggest to you that this text is really not about rams and goats and horns. This 
text has those details to convey the message of God. But the, the thing I think that the two things I think we need to really see here, two realities that are more important than any of the details of the shape of the vision and of the events they predict. Two big realities we need to see is first that sin leads to desolation. And second, that Christ Jesus stands ready to make everything right again. And I want to show you before we move into the more sort of uh, fascinating details of the passage that are really secondary. I want to show you why I said those two things. First, that sin leads to desolation. And secondly, that Christ stands ready one day to make things right again. So the first reason, as I, I see summed up in verse 13, the angel asks a question. And in the angel's question about this vision, the angel gives us a pretty good summary of the vision so far. Then I heard, Daniel says in verse 13, I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning... This is what the vision is about in his mind, in his summary. How long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? Let's get our terms straight before we move on. There's a couple things there that I find to be mistranslations or poor translations, although they be common and although these translations be held by many, many better Bible translators than myself. The first thing is uh, where he says the regular burnt offering. You might have seen that in the English Standard Version. Your text might have something a little bit different. The NIV puts it a little bit differently. The regular burnt offering is not what that word means. It's just one word in Hebrew. It's the word tamid. You don't need to write that down. It's just a single word. And the word means continual, regular, permanent, something like that. And I agree with the scholars uh, Kyle and DeLitch who have argued and shown, I think, very persuasively that this is a word that is often attached to different parts of God's law about worship in the Old Testament. So when God said you should always worship like this, very often it said this, is, this should be tamid, this should be the permanent, this should be continual, this should be normal for you. And so this word, Kyle and DeLitch argue, uh, should be understood here to mean everything that's part of the normal and proper true worship of God. Whatever goes along with true worship of God, that's what this is. So, let's look at verse 13 again and read it that way. For how long is the vision concerning the proper worship of God, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary to be trampled underfoot? The second thing here is the transgression that makes desolate. Often this becomes a sort of a prophecy catchphrase. But it's not, I think it should not be, we should not read it like that and immediately load into this verse all kinds of other ideas from Bible prophecy. Maybe we've seen the movie or read the 13 books in the series uh, written by so-and-so, co-written with so-and-so. And, and, um, and uh, you know, those kinds of things should not filter too much into our thinking as we read the Bible. It should be the other way around. And so let's look at this, saying the transgression that makes desolate is just another way of saying what was already said before in verse 12, that the people and the true worship will be lost or will be given away into the hand of this little horn because of transgression. You see those words in verse 12, because of transgression. So the transgression is the cause behind the desolation. It's the desolation results because of the transgression. That's why it says the transgression that makes desolate. The transgression uh, that underlies the desolation, that is the cause behind the desolation that the angel asks about in verse 13. And that's the first reality we need to see here. More important than most of the other details of this text is that we need to see one of these two th- main themes. The vision of the evenings and mornings, all of chapter 8, first hinges on the idea that sin leads to desolation. Transgression brings desolation. The second reality is as full of hope and promise as the first one is of warning. Verse 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, and and that's a Hebrew word, it's like, wow, look at that. Behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. 
one in the appearance of a man. And then what does this one who is in the appearance of a man do? He gives a command to the angel. He commands the angel Gabriel. Look at verse 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So the most important person in this text is the one, it's not Daniel, it's the one commanding the angels. The most important person in this text, in the appearance of a man, he commands an angel to go help Daniel. I I think this is the commander of the host. I think this is who verse 25 describes as the prince of princes. And I believe that because of what happened when Joshua himself stood in front of this or near the city of Jericho and behold, there was the commander of the Lord's army standing in front of him, talking to him. He didn't realize it at first, but when he did, he fell on his face and worshipped because he was standing on holy ground. The commander of the Lord's armies, we should call him Christ. The prince of princes, verse 25 says, It was Christ himself whom Daniel saw standing at the Ulai Canal. The Son of God was not inactive before he was born in Bethlehem. The Son of God was alive and eternal and powerful and ruling, active in the world, appearing to his people from time to time and making God the Father known as he has always done. So Daniel hears his voice from the banks of the Ulai Canal. And I think that's the real shocker. That's what's amazing right here. We read in verse 1 that this is in, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, which places it at about 550 BC. This is the 10 years before uh, Persia conquered Babylon. So Daniel's still under the Babylonian government. He's still working for the government. It's 550 BC. Meanwhile, off in Persia, Cyrus the Great has just brought the Medes and the Persians under one empire. It's just happened that year. And 10 years later, well, nine years later, and 540, 539 BC, Cyrus the Great would go from Persia and travel over to Susa, which is where this vision takes place, where Daniel sees in this vision, the city of Susa, and Cyrus the Great would cross the Ulai Canal and invade Susa and make it his capital. That was going to happen nine years later. But guess who was there before Cyrus? Guess who was already ruling over Susa? It was the Christ. The Christ stood on the bank where nine years later Cyrus would stood on the, stand on the bank of the Ulai Canal according to the earlier verses. And where Cyrus was going to invade, Christ had already invaded. Where Cyrus was going to rule, Christ was already ruling. If we don't understand that, we're missing the two greatest things in this passage. Sin brings desolation. But Christ has promised a day of restoration. Look at verse 14. Here's his promise. He said to me, for 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be, the Hebrew says, made right. Restored to its rightful state. There is desolation because of our sin, and yet there is hope because of Christ's promise. This is what this passage is about. All the rest of the details, all the history it foretells, all the pain it foresees, prepares us for those days when we will be in despair and we will be full of dread and we will wonder where is the promise of the Lord and we will go back to a text like this and say, the sin in my life, my rebellion against God, the rebellion of my whole people, the sin of the world and its transgressions is the cause of of desolation, and yet there is a Savior who brings a hope of promise, and one day He will make our sin right again. He will restore what we've ruined. So look with me at verses 17 and 18. So He came near, this is Gabriel, at the command of Christ, He comes near where I stood. And when He came, I was frightened and fell on my face, but He said to me, Understand, O Son of Man, that the vision is for the time of the end. I said that Jesus would make everything right one day. 
And that's what the angel makes sure Daniel hears. The worst desolations and the best redemption is for the time of the end. It's still to come. It's a long way off. And it was either the weight of this knowledge, the burden of it, or the frightening holiness of the angel who came to Daniel from the presence of God himself. And Daniel passes out. And so the angel Christ sent, the angel Gabriel, we're told, he touches Daniel and strengthens him and makes him stand and equips him to be able to hear and understand so he could write and minister to God's people. To everyone who reads this. Look at verse 19. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. This isn't about Daniel's lifetime. It's not for Daniel that Daniel would be ministering. It's not for Daniel that he would serve. This was not for Daniel's benefit alone. This was for ours, for the Jews, for everybody who has lived since Daniel. It's not even for the generation after Daniel. It's about the events in the latter end of the indignation, it says, and also the appointed time of the end. Indignation. Don't pass over that word without noticing it. The indignation here refers to the wrath of God. It's the same word that's parallel to the wrath of God in Jeremiah 10.10. The anger of God that this prophecy says would one day fall upon the Jewish people. That's the indignation. This is about the latter end of God's wrath being poured out on the Jewish people. But God's indignation would not last forever. I was encouraged last week, uh, one of you, and I won't mention her name, uh, one of you uh, uh, pointed out to me that the 2300 evenings and mornings, if we took normal Bible numbers, it would have been seven years of mornings and evenings, which would be 2520 mornings and evenings. The reason, at least one theological reason why it's given as 2300 mornings and evenings, and I agree with what she said, is because God was shortening the time. He was not giving the full measure of the wrath that he could have. It was less than a full allotment of wrath and judgment. That's, I think, a primary theological meaning of this number, the 2300 evenings and mornings. The anger of God that this prophecy said would fall would be cut short. God's indignation will not last forever. Isaiah 54, 8 says, In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Well, that brings us to the 2300 evenings and mornings, which we have to talk about briefly before we move on. Otherwise, I won't do justice to this passage. 2300, 2300 evenings and mornings is an unusual phrase in the Bible. Evenings and mornings brings it back. If you do a word search on your computer like I did, uh, then you'll find it goes back to Genesis 1, where the days are defined as periods of evenings and mornings. And yet, I think when Daniel is told this, the 2300 evenings and mornings, and at the end of the passage, in verse 26, the angel tells Daniel, the vision of the evenings and mornings is true. The vision of the evenings and mornings is like the title of this whole chapter. It's what this vision is about. It's not the vision of the little horn. It's not the vision of the goat. It's the vision of the evenings and mornings because that's the main theme here for Daniel to hang on to. The 2300 evenings and mornings, let's leave the number aside for a minute, but the the phrase evenings and mornings, as I said last week, it brings to mind the warnings of Moses that also predicted Israel's desolation because of transgression in passages like Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. And if you don't know those chapters, and if you love Bible history, and if you're interested in knowing what is the flow of the whole story of the scripture, you need to know those chapters, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. In those passages, Moses warned that one day God would destroy the city of Israel, the cities of Israel and scatter the Jews among the nations of the earth and he predicted the evenings and mornings that the Jews would hope would bring relief would bring dread instead 
He said this, he said, your life shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, if only it were evening. And at evening you shall say, if only it were morning. Because of the dread that your heart shall feel. Deuteronomy 28, 66. Verse 14 then is really the key, I think, to the vision in Daniel chapter 8. Gabriel himself describes this whole vision as the vision of the evenings and mornings, talking about those evenings and mornings of dread that Moses said would come upon you. During the time that you are scattered, that your people are scattered among the nations of the earth. And 600 years after this, when Daniel saw this, 600 years later, Jesus himself stood outside of Jerusalem and looked at the city and grieved for her. For the city of Jerusalem itself, that his people had not put their hope in him. They had not prayed to him in their time of trouble, when they languished under the occupation of the armies of Persia and of Greece and of now of Rome. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate. Where was Christ at that time? Standing just outside the city of Jerusalem. I might as well leave that up. He was standing outside Jerusalem weeping for his people. Where was Christ when Persia was invading the Babylonian Empire? He was there on the banks of the Ulai Canal. Where was Christ when the Greeks came and replaced the Persians as the overlords of Israel? He was there. He was in control. He was as close as a prayer. Where was Christ when the Persians threatened genocide? Where was Christ when the Greek Syrian king Antiochus slaughtered thousands of Jews and profaned the temple of God? Where was Christ in the wars of the Maccabees that we read about in those books? He was there. He was in control and he was as close as a prayer. Where was Christ when the Greek empire split up into Macedonia, Thrace, Syria, and Egypt? He was there, wasn't he? waiting to hear his people call out to him. Where was Christ when Pompey conquered Jerusalem for Rome and again profaned the temple? Or when Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, which has never been built again in 70 AD? Where was Christ then? Where is Christ when we need him? Christ was there grieving that his people had not come to him and taken shelter under his wings. That is why the city was left to them desolate. Christ had come. He had traveled the highways and the byways of Israel, preaching, repent and believe the good news. Repent because sin leads to desolation and believe the good news. Because I will bring restoration. Repent and believe the good news, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's in Mark 1.15. Sin leads to desolation, but the good news is that for everyone who believes in Christ, death is not the end. He will restore, redeem, revive, and resurrect what our sin has ruined. That's where you say amen. Amen. Okay. So the gospel in Daniel 8 is that as bad as it gets, while we wait for Christ, he has not left us, he has not abandoned his people, he hears our prayers, he even knows when we long to understand the scripture, and he sends ministering spirits to help us. He sends his spirit in our time of need. He sends his word to us. Daniel's vision showed that he has a plan to make things right at the end of the time of desolation. He hears our prayers. He knows our sufferings. 
Daniel's vision showed Daniel's people, the Jews, that after Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the people were finally scattered among the nations and Moses' warnings of the dreaded evenings and mornings of, of dread and desolation came true, that the prince... The prince of princes who sovereignly decreed even such a long time earlier that these things would happen. The centuries of desolation that were coming because of sin. That that prince of princes was always standing ready to save. Second Chronicles 7.14 said, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. But Jesus said they would not. Desolations are decreed because of trans- transgression. Gabriel tells Daniel to look yet in the future for another more devastating enemy, not in the Persian Empire, not in the Greek Empire, or even in one of the four Greek su- successor kingdoms. But verse 9 tells us, out of the side of one of those kingdoms, a new kingdom will emerge from either Macedonia, Thrace, Syria, or Egypt. Those were the four horns. Look with me at verse 23 as the angel interprets this. And at the latter end of their kingdom, the kingdom of those four horns, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. By the time Jesus was born, these four Greek kingdoms were taken over by the Roman Empire, but they were still there. They were still there. Greek-speaking kingdoms in those lands, now under Roman subjugation, I guess. They weren't destroyed by Rome. In Daniel's first vision, in chapter 7, verse 12, the defeated beasts lose their power, they lose their dominion, but they're still left alive in place. And so we see here, just like in that passage, Daniel chapter 7, verse 12, if you need to underline that, we see here that the Greek-speaking kingdoms, the four horns in Macedonia, which is the mainland Greece today, not the southern peninsula, but the mainland Greece, in Thrace, which is most of western Turkey, in Syria, which is all the rest we know from eastern, eastern Turkey down through modern-day Syria and Palestine, Jordan, and so on, and then in Egypt... All those four Greek-speaking kingdoms outlasted the Western Roman Empire itself. They were thereafter. Their bodies were still there, although they never regained domination. So what happened? What happened to those countries, those kingdoms, those peoples? What happened to those lands in which all the way around the Mediterranean there were Christian communities for hundreds of years? Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of church plants. Because church planting is a special place in my heart. I wanted to throw that in there. What happened to those Christian cultures who gave us so many of our ancient uh, understandings, our ancient documents, the scriptures, the histories of which we know the Christian church? What happened to them? They're not there anymore, so what happened? Desolations were decreed at the hand of a new kingdom. And there's a few clues about this kingdom, a few details we need to see in this verse. First, verse 23 says it's at the latter end, it's at the end of the lifetime of the four Greek kingdoms. Second, it's not another Greek speaking kingdom that will be this arch enemy. It will not belong to the territory once ruled by Greece, it's not coming out of the head of the goat itself. It's a new kingdom, not out of Greece, but out of land that one of those four kingdoms later on acquires. So that's why it can come out of the side of one of the horns, come out of one of the kingdoms, but still not be part of the Greek goat, not come out of its head directly. Does that make sense? Do I need to back up and try to try to explain what I mean by that? Everybody's with me? Okay. The reason is... (laughs) So if, if this little horn was to be a part of the Greek territory, it would be seen coming up out of the body of the goat, out of the, Greek, the, the, ho- the head of the Greek goat. Like in chapter 7 when the 11th horn comes up and pushes three out of the way, it's in the head of that Roman monster. This goat doesn't have another kingdom emerge out of its head. It's got a, a, a kingdom emerge out of one of the other kingdoms, which means that territory never belonged to the Greek goat. It's new. That's what it means, I think. Other scholars will take it differently. You should weigh those things yourself. 
So verse 9 tells us it's not another Greek-speaking kingdom, but a new kingdom uh, from the side of one of those original four king, Greek kingdoms. And thirdly, it's a kingdom growing out from this new territory that's added on to one of the four horns at some point later on. That's the force, I think, of verses 8 and 9, what they tell us to look for. Fourth, this kingdom is not an individual only, but a kingdom, like all the other horns in Daniel's prophecies. But this king starts a kingdom, that's fifth, it starts a kingdom, and he's a cunning deceiver and a liar, in verse 23. Sixth, and last, it comes at a time when the transgressors are near their end, they've reached their limit, when the Jewish people whose transgression is causing this desolation is the reason for it, are right near the end. So, in verse 11, we saw that this king will exalt himself. Look at that verse. It's amazing. That, this king will exalt himself even against the prince of the host, the commander of the armies of the Lord, the prince of princes, according to verse 25. This king will exalt himself even to make himself equal, as it were, with the, with the Christ himself. He will stop people from the regular worship of Christ. He will take away the regular worship of Christ. And he will destroy the place of the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Now let's see what Gabriel explains to Daniel in verses 24 and 25. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. If we make a list of these clues in that verse, we find that he'll have great power that's not his own, it doesn't belong to him, it's not from his own ability. He'll cause fearful destruction. He'll succeed in what he does. He destroys mighty men and destroys holy people. That's what saints are. Verse 25. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. I like that, in his own mind. Haven't we all done that? Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but not but by no human hand. So if we made a list of these clues, we see that deceit will prosper because of his cunning. We see that in his heart he will make himself great. We see that without warning he will destroy many. We see that he shall rise against the prince of princes. We see that he will be broken without a human hand, without human agency. Hi, Joan. Good to see you. You snuck in so well. But I saw you from the back. <laughs> so here's a thing I think you should know. You should know that most commentators will disagree with what, I'll, what I'm about to say to you. And you should weigh that seriously. If, if you hear a preacher kind of go off on a tangent that not many other teachers go, you should be cautious. And yet... And yet there are others who would say that the conclusion that most teachers have reached, that this passage, this little horn, is one of the kings of Greek Syria, part of the Seleucid kingdom, a man named Antiochus, Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes, according to history, that there are reasons to think that can't be Antiochus. Some of the details sort of seem like Antiochus, but Sir Isaac Newton, who was a pretty bright guy, he nailed it when he pointed out some problems with saying this is Antiochus. He said Antiochus wasn't a new kingdom. He was part of one of the four. He was part of the Seleucid Syrian kingdom. He was one of them. And second, this horn grows exceedingly great. But Antiochus never expanded the kingdom. He was not exceedingly great. He didn't grow exceedingly great. This horn was strong and unstoppable. Antiochus was incredibly stoppable. He did what Rome told him to do. This horn is bold and fierce. But Antiochus was frightened out of invading Egypt when an elderly senator came from Rome, drew a line in the sand and said, you can't cross that line until you give me your decision. And he backed down and sent his armies home because of an old man from the Roman Senate. That's where we get the, the, the idea of a line in the sand. People were... People were uh, actually respecting that line a long time before American presidents recently drew such lines in Syria. 
Wow, I just said that out loud. I'm sorry. Forgive me, please. Verse 24 says, This horn is powerful with someone else's power. Antiochus's power was all his own. This horn stands against Christ, the prince of princes, the prince of the host. And he robs Christ of worship. He takes away the regular worship from Christ. Antiochus was long dead when Christ was born. This horn destroys the place of the temple. Destroys it. There is no other way to translate that phrase that he casts it down, but that he destroys it. Antiochus polluted the temple, but left its buildings intact. So the clues here only fit one suspect as far as I can tell. And here, I am way out on a limb. I think it's the right meaning of the passage. I've worked at this. I think the exegesis is correct. And yet, it's not a popular opinion. So you should take that with a great big... Take it with the whole salt shaker. Just not, not a grain. Take it with the whole thing. One of the four kingdoms, verse 22. The Greek-speaking Syria, in my opinion... When it was under Roman control, it took over a piece of land that had never before been occupied by any of the any of the four beasts, the 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 Babylon, Persia, Greek, or Greece, or Rome. Syria later on, when it was later under Roman government, it added on a new piece of territory that had been ruled by the Nabataean kingdom. So this is Greek Syria around 75 BC, and it added a new piece of territory that had belonged to Nabatea, and it made it into a Roman province, uh, and it, that Roman province for a while was under the government of Syria. It was the Syrian troops from, um, from Syria that had taken over that kingdom under Scaurus at the orders of Pompey in about 62 BC, I believe. And finally, in about 106 AD, Trajan made it part of, Rome, part of the Roman Empire itself, but its own province. And it extended all the way south into what today is a part of Saudi Arabia called the Hejaz area, the Hejaz province. The Hejaz, northern Hejaz was part of this territory that had been added on to the Syrian kingdom. 400 years later, out of the southernmost tip of Roman Syria, out of the southernmost tip of this Roman province, another kingdom emerged. Muhammad ibn Abdullah started a new dynasty. His original kingdom was the province of Hejaz, where we find Mecca and Medina today. He founded not just an ordinary kingdom, but a religious, a spiritual kingdom. So, uh, Muhammad's religious militant kingdom grew, and the the trajectory of history, if you look back at verse 9... It says that out of one of these horns came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, and then toward the east, then toward the glorious land. If you notice the spread of Muhammad's kingdom, Muhammad's empire, there's, there's um, uh, Hejaz in the green, and then Muhammad's empire spread first south, and then east, and then towards the beautiful land, towards Palestine. I had all kinds of things ready to say about this, but in the interest of finishing in the next 45 minutes or so, I think I'll kind of move right along some of these things. I didn't make the map. I got it from, um, it wasn't Wikipedia. You, you can ask for my notes and you can get all the sources where I found these things. The thing is that as Islam grew, and I'm arguing that this little horn, this kingdom, is Islam itself as an empire, as a militant power, not Muslims, okay, not Arabs, and that's really important to say. But as Islam spread and as it grew, Christianity was snuffed out all over the Mediterranean world, all around the Mediterranean world. Not totally snuffed out, but largely snuffed out. The people of the host, not just the Jews, but also the saints, the holy ones, were given into the hand of Islam in in battle after battle after battle. Christians and Jews were trampled underfoot, but so was Jerusalem. So was the holy place, the place of God's sanctuary, where his, his temple had once stood. The foundations of that temple were also trampled underfoot. And if that can serve as an example, as sort of a symbol 
of what happened as Islam spread into country after country in the Greek-speaking world where Christianity was removed and replaced by Islamic worship. An example of that is only in recent years it was found in the archaeological findings on Temple Mount in Jerusalem that before the uh, Aqsa Mosque, Al-Aqsa Mosque had stood there, there was before that a Greek-speaking church a Greek-speaking church on, on the ruins of that site had been there before. And when Omar invaded uh, Palestine and conquered Jerusalem in 640-ish, I can't think, the middle of, sixth century, middle of 600s, he rebuilt, he devastated a church there. He ruined a church, uh, demolished it in order to build the mosque that stands there with the Golden Dome, dome today. If we look for an example of when Islam... Um, Slaughtered many, many, many people in the name of religion. When the host was given into his hand, there are many examples, but one that stands out is one that we tragically remember 102 years ago this week. 102 years ago this week, when the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim Ottoman Empire, slaughtered, started a genocide that killed 1.5 million Armenian Christians. 102 years ago this week. Does Muhammad exalt himself even against the prince of princes? He does. He puts himself on par with Jesus as a prophet. He makes himself, as it were, equal with the Christ. And his teachings have set generations of his followers against Christ and against the people of Christ. He brought religious war to the Middle East, a fire that no one has been able to put out ever since. Now let me say it's a conflict where Christians and Muslims have done great wrong against each other in the name of religion, time after time after time. But two things stand out as final. Two things stand. The prince of princes, Christ himself did not command those wars. The prince of princes will one day, according to verse 14, restore the sanctuary in Jerusalem from the devastation that it has suffered. That's verse 14. And this horn, this is the second thing, this horn, this religious and anti-Christian tyrant will be broken. Ultimately, by the hand of God, not by any human hand, but by the hand of Christ himself. Verse 25. And if I looked for a way to understand what period of time can those 2300 evenings and mornings possibly measure, I think the main meaning is Someone argued last week. You can check with her after the service for for who she is and and do a straw poll or something. But she argued last week, and I think she's right. The main theological idea is that it's God shortening the time of punishment. But it's also a measurement. As uh, many Protestant commentators, including Isaac Newton, have argued, in Daniel, days always stand in the prophecies of Daniel. Days stand for years, as we'll see in two weeks. But using the the Hebrew calendar, 2300 years is the time from when the four horns in verse 8 first arose, in verse 8 after the battle of Ipsus in 301 BC, until the trampling of the place of the sanctuary ended in the Six Day War in 1967, is 2300 Hebrew years. So look with me at verses 26 and 27. And don't get caught up on the details of this prophecy. Keep the main thing the main thing. Sin brings desolation, and yet Christ stands ready to restore and redeem. Verses 26 and 27. The angel tells Daniel, The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days, and then I rose and went about the king's business. But I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. The vision was not for Daniel's time. It was for a long, long time afterwards. The vision of evenings and mornings, the days and nights of dread that Moses had predicted would be the long desolation of the Jewish people. It's a true vision. History tells a frightening story 
of a nation that just would not listen to the message Jesus proclaimed when he reached their cities and towns saying, repent and believe the good news because the kingdom of God is at hand. There is a desolation. But there will also be a restoration. And I said that's frightening, the story of history. I said it's a frightening story. Because I think all of us are tempted to ignore Jesus' warnings and the warnings of Scripture that sin leads to destruction. To ignore that and indulge our sin and play mind games with God or or put him out like we're horses wearing blinkers. As if we don't look at him, it's like my dog. If I don't look at you, it's not real. I'm not in trouble if I don't look at you. Really? We're tempted to ignore the warnings of Scripture and make light of our sin and still live in it. But humility and repentance leads to salvation in the name of Jesus Christ because of what he has done. But Daniel was appalled. And he said he went about his business for the king of Babylon until about 12 years later, as we read next week. Until about 12 years later, when he got on his knees and he repented for himself and for his people. And he didn't hide his sin. He didn't minimize it or trivialize it. He confessed it openly. Because Christ stands ready to restore what has been ruined by our sin. The Prince of Princes is also the Prince of Peace. And when all these things come upon you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Is this not what has been happening among the Jewish people for a while? A regathering from where they were scattered. Secondly, this prophecy said that this evil king would be broken but by no human hand. Islam would be broken but by no human hand. And and sometime in the next few months I want to bring over a, a Muslim missionary who I just met yesterday. He's not Muslim now, he's a missionary to Muslims. And he's going to tell us stories, if I can get him to come, stories of Muslims seeing visions of Christ and coming to an understanding of the gospel by the testimony of some friend. Muslim after Muslim after Muslim coming to faith in Christ. In fact, there's a, there's a report. I don't know how valid it is or how trustworthy its detail, but it estimates that approximately 30% of the largest Muslim nation in the world, Indonesia, has come to Christ. That's so incredible, it's unbelievable. Even if it's 10%, it's a miraculous show of God's mercy The power of this false religion will be broken but by no human hand. So let us not make enemies of lost people. Let us pray for deliverance. Let us pray that Jesus will restore what has been broken. That the Lord will bring grace in these latter times. That people will know the name of Jesus and find hope and healing in his wings. Father, we ask for mercy. We bow ourselves before the authority of your word, Lord, knowing that we may not have all the details and there might be room, there is room for a difference of opinion and that's good. But Lord, we know this, that Christ is king. We know as John Newton said, even though my memory is fading, I know these two great things, that I am a great sinner, but Christ is a great savior. And so Lord as we acknowledge that there is ruin in our lives because of our sin, and yet there is greater ruin in our world because of Adam's sin. And we've corroborated that and gone on with it for a long time. Father, forgive our land. Heal our nation, Lord, we pray, but we also ask for healing in our own families where sin has wreaked a great tragedy. We ask for healing in our own personal lives, in our marriages, in our relationships with one another, in our relationships with our children. We ask, Lord, that you would repay what the locusts have eaten. We ask that you would bring grace and restoration because of Jesus Christ. 
because he stands ready. He is on the banks of the Pacific Ocean today around Victoria, just as he was on the banks of the Ulai Canal. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is going to be revealed one day soon as the triumphant Lord who has returned to claim his possession, to take his bride, to rule forever. We ask, Father, that you would keep us faithful and believing in Jesus Christ, shunning sin, obeying the Lord and loving him and teaching others to do the same. For we ask that you would make us a disciple-making people of Jesus Christ. For your glory, Father, we pray. Amen.